Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our first um, plenary session. And I'm very um, glad um, to be on the stage with quite an esteemed um, group of, of leaders. My name is um, Comfort Aero. Um, very glad as Crisis Group's new president and CEO, as well as a strategic partner of the Doha Forum, to be moderating um, this opening plenary session. Um, as I said, I'm joined by an, a, gr a group of esteemed gentlemen who've already been introduced. So without further ado, um, I would like to begin um, our conversation. We have quite a, a tight, um, packed agenda, uh, 50 minutes of, of conversation between um, all four of us, all four of you. Um, and as we said, the theme of the entire session transforming um, for a new era, coming out of a, a global um, pandemic, um, confronting the new existential crisis of climate change, and also in the midst of uh, a war um, in, in Ukraine as well. And all these raise a number of serious questions um, for us to discuss, not just today, but in all the sessions um, that we have over the weekend. But Your Excellency um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Al Abdul Rahman bin Jazim El Tahani, can I first start um, with you um, of my opening question. Um, the current um, pace of change that we're seeing in the international um, community, growing multipolarity is how many observers are seeing the transformation that we're seeing in the international arena. There's growing polarization on multiple fronts, growing conflicts, not just in Ukraine, um, we have Afghanistan, we have Iran also to, to deal with, um, to name a few. The picture tends to look very bleak at, at the current situation. Um, we're seeing um, more and more increased tensions um, as we speak across um, many frontiers. Um, and pardon me for phrasing it this way, and pardon me for being slightly provocative as well, but as a small country that is often accused um, of punching above its weight. Um, how can Qatar, or how does Qatar um, intend um, to navigate the choppy waters of multipolarity and a very polarized international um, system that we're seeing today? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Comfort, for being with us. And I just learned that it's your birthday today, so I wish you a happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> I'm really also glad to see all our friends among us here today and uh, to have them uh, participating in Doha Forum after suspending for two years, just hosting it virtually because of uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, regarding your, your question and the theme of this year transforming uh, uh, to a new era, Actually, we believe that uh, any transition uh, normally is, is a bumpy way and uh, a lot of uh, crises are happening and we are exposed to high uh, geopolitical risks. But uh, in the past decades, actually, our world being built based on interconnectedness between different countries. So we cannot uh, be isolated or are not affected by any of the global crisis. Uh, one of the main issues that everyone is talking about right now is climate change. Climate change is a global problem that's going to affect all of us, whether we are small or large uh, countries. And I think that uh, uh, what the international community is trying to do now in order to anticipate uh, the consequences is already a late response, but we need to work on it collectively. But another example is the pandemic. And we have seen that uh, COVID uh, hit all of us and all, all the consequences of COVID, we are still uh, living uh, through it. But we have seen that if there are inequality in vaccination and treatment of the COVID, uh, this is go going to mean that there are new variants going to be developed and this uh, pandemic is going just to prolong. And the last but not least is geopolitical crisis. When we see uh, any crisis happening in, in any part of the world, uh, it's definitely have its impact uh, first on the direct neighbors, but then on the entire world, whether it's 
an issue of uh, uh, if there are conflicts, we will see uh, people fleeing from their countries being refugees. Those refugees are going to create crises in another country. Any humanitarian catastrophe is going to have its domino uh, effect or uh, it will affect the supply chain, as we have seen and witnessing right now between Ukraine and Russia. Both of them are representing the world food basket uh, in terms of wheat, in terms of corn, a lot of uh, uh, other supplies. Also, we have seen this is impacting uh, the energy, uh, the energy market. So, uh, as Qatar, as you mentioned, uh, is a small state, and uh, what a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, claiming that we are punching above our weight. It's not about punching above our weight. It's about our regional stability and international peace. And being an effective uh, member of the international community is, is very important. If we can contribute uh, uh, to bring more peace and stability to our region or uh, maintaining the international security and international order. Uh, for us, it's, it's very important to maintain the international order, to maintain the international legitimacy and to preserve uh, the UN Charter and the principles of the uh, of the international law, because we are a small country that are protected by by this uh, multilateralism, and all other small countries are uh, in the same position. And uh, for us to make sure that our region is stable, it's in it's directly in our national interest. For us, for being a platform for diplomacy and dialogue. It's also an important, uh, for an important national security issue in order to stabilize uh, the region around us and uh, to maintain the international peace and stability. So we cannot be isolated from what's happening around us in the world, and we have to play an active role and to provide at least uh, uh, a positive contribution uh, to international peace and stability. And I believe that Qatar has been building uh, a track record in uh, dialogue and diplomacy with, in different uh, conflict areas, whether it's in Sudan or in Lebanon, or uh, between, it was between Djibouti and Eritrea. And the fact that dialogue is the only way forward and the only way to end uh, any crisis or any potential conflict has proven that it's, uh, it's, the, it's, it's the right way because we have never seen a war that ended in the battlefield. We have been always witnessing and living uh, throughout any crisis by solving it around, at, uh, around the table, uh, by, through diplomatic talks, through uh, concessions by both parties. And this is, will be the only way forward. There, there will never be a zero-sum game. And we believe that for the current crisis, we need to provide short-term, mid-term, and long-term solution in order to preserve the international order. Um, Your Excellency, before I turn um, to His Highness to um, ask him a question, I just want to follow up on your emphasis on dialogue as well. Because your, your, your country um, is under pressure from various sides um, to, to take a side, um, to, to take one position or another. How do you balance that pressure um, to, to enter various camps with your focus on dialogue? And we, we've seen ourselves, your, your efforts to hold dialogues on a host of crises, but how do you balance that pressure? And how do you balance that with principles and taking positions? And it will be interesting to understand your model and lessons from, from dialogue as well. Well, I think it's, it's very simple that sticking to uh, the principles, the international principles and the principles of international law are the basic things. So if you will just you know, have an overview about our positions in different political crises, it has been always based on a principled position. So, we are against uh, infringing the sovereignty of any country or uh, interfering in internal affairs or the threatening of, by the use of force or using the force against any country. It's applied everywhere, whether it's we are against, uh, uh, we are against the, any use of force against the civilians. For example, in Ukraine, we know that there are concerns by both parties 
uh, uh, and this needs to be addressed diplomatically. We are against the Israeli occupation to the, to the Palestinians, and we want uh, to see this resolved. We have never applied a double standard. That's our standards has been very much unified. Despite the pressure, we have to stick to the principle and to protect these, these principles. And we urge all the countries in the international community to protect these principles. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. Your Highness, um, I want to pose a similar question to you. As we're coming out of a global pandemic, we're facing an existential crisis with climate change, an increasingly polarized world. We are seeing the return of sort of, uh, you know, an invasion on a, on a large scale, various perceptions out there as to the, the, the right and wrong of the conflict. But how, from a Saudi Arabia um, position particularly, how do you position yourself? How do you um, position yourself to navigate a very turbulent um, sort of geopolitical terrain that we're seeing. Your Highness, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Comfort. And I think COVID and the things that have come after have reinforced for us the importance of multilateralism. So that's the first thing, that we all need to work together. We are not going to overcome the challenges that we face, whether it's COVID, whether it's the next pandemic, and there's inevitably going to be one, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, issues like the war in Ukraine, without all of us working together. And one of the elements I feel that have been missing is the global south being really engaged, developing nations, especially smaller and middle powers, in setting the global agenda, in making sure that the global agenda addresses the needs of all, not just the needs of few. And here, I think we are trying to be a lot more engaged with our partners, especially, as I said, in the developing world, in the global south, to work together to be more effective in setting the global agenda on all of these subjects, whether it's uh, de you know, global development, whether it's uh, access to education, access to things like water and uh, uh, electrification in rural areas, etc. I mean, there's a long list of things, even conflict resolutions. Uh, I think uh, if we are not all engaged, and as I say, uh, us middle powers and us developing nations in addressing these challenges which often occur in our parts of the world, I think we are going to face a very difficult future. So that's our focus uh, right now. Thank you very much, Your Highness. Can I just tease um, out a little bit more um, in terms of the, the Global South, and particularly the Global South, um, and it's not homogeneous, there are many, many perspectives in the, in the Global South, the, the, the position particularly um, in relation to how we tackle or deal or respond to um, the kind of um, in, invasion that we've seen um, today in Ukraine. So we had a very principled um, position taken, for example, um, by the Kenyan um, ambassador um, to the United Nations. Um, many of us, myself included, thought that he spoke on behalf of many of us in the, in the global south. Does that perspective um, resonate um, right across many frontiers, or are there differences of opinion in how to solve the problem that we're seeing today um, in Ukraine? Certainly there are differences of opinion, but I think we all agree that the priority is to end the conflict, to end the, uh, the suffering of the civilian population, and uh, to uh, address the issue in line with international norms, with international, uh, with international accepted international law, and with full respect to the United Nations Charter. So I think there's no, almost no disagreement, I think, in that. How we achieve that goal, there may be differences, but here again, it's important that we have a dialogue. And uh, if we are to engage the global community, we have to listen to the global community. Good. Thank you very much, Your Highness. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham, if I can turn um, to you, sir. Um, one of the themes that, um, that came out um, when you look at the, the narrative, the agenda, of the entire weekend, and I'd like to quote it to you and get your response um, from that. Um, the balance of power, global power, continues to drastically shift from its previous one-man equilibrium, with Russia and China cementing their positions as leading rivals of the United States and calling into question the responsibilities of their power's necessities. How should the US position itself with this new sort of transformation 
that we're seeing with new arrivals and ones that I know that particularly um, you have concerns about from the United States? Well, number one, I speak the worst English of anybody on this stage, so <laughs> I want to let you know that. Uh, so the first thing I think the United States needs to do is to be a better friend and a more worthy adversary. Uh, we're in competition with lots of forces. So I want to thank the people of uh, Qatar, the Emir, for helping get Americans out of Afghanistan. Thank you so much. I think our biggest enemy in Afghanistan was corruption. After 20 years of an international effort to bring about a better day, uh, we failed. I think the Taliban were empowered by the inability to deal with corruption. The young woman who spoke reminds us all the hope of Afghanistan. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, usually with Senator McCain, 51 times since 9-11. And I am confident that the Taliban rule over Afghanistan will not last. They're outliers in terms of the hopes and dreams and aspirations of the Afghan people. As to Russia, Russia has decided to use force of arms to achieve a goal that Putin has been talking about for a very long time. And it's been a time of choosing for the world writ large. The fact that the Saudis are here at this conference means that the embargo's over. And I'm glad to see both of you on the stage because we have to be together. So the UAE and Saudi Arabia have been reluctant to join in a resolution condemning the invasion. We have been reluctant in the United States to speak out against the Houthis, who have been constantly harassing the region. So I will lead an effort back home to put the Houthis back on the foreign terrorist list. I think that's where they belong, from my point of view. So um, the point is that Putin has brought America together. Putin has made NATO stronger. We all cheered uh, President Zelensky. You know, talking about climate change in this region, I feel like a vegetarian at a beef convention. <laughs> Can you explain what that means? <laughs> <laughs> so, the point is that everybody up here talking about climate change, probably 70% of your GDP depends on oil and gas. What have we learned from Russia? That our response to punish Putin, to end this conflict, is very much restricted because of the dependency that Europe has developed over Russian oil and gas. So not only would it be good for the climate to move to alternative cleaner sources of fuel, I think it would be the biggest change in geopolitics in my lifetime is to get away from fossil fuels. So America sees Putin as the bad guy and Ukraine as the good guy. Here's my question for the body. We all want the war to end, the suffering to stop. But how do you end this war? And what are the acceptable terms? If after this is all over, Putin is still standing and is stronger, then the world has failed because the international order that we talk about will have been obliterated. If on the other hand, Putin is seen as having lost, this misadventure was his demise, then I think China would think twice about going into Taiwan and it would create 
an opportunity to start all over again. What you've seen on your televisions, like all of us, is war crimes on an industrial scale. The question for the world is, can that be forgiven? Can we be the world we want to be and let Putin get away with this? The answer for me is no. Thank you. Let me, thank you very much. Let me pose that question to the high representative. Can we be the world we want to be and still have Putin? As a, as a high, your Royal Highness um, made clear, um, you know, you're focused on multilateral cooperation. You are, in a sense, a representative of one of the most important multilateral corporations today in the form of the, Un the European Union. What, it, what do you see as the way out today um, for, um, for Ukraine? How do we begin to, to, to find, um, as Senator Lindsey Graham was pointing to, an acceptable um, path out um, of the crisis um, that we're facing today? Thank you. Look, um, for us Europeans, the war in Ukraine is the war in our borders. But it's not an European issue. It's not just Ukrainian, no European, not the West. It's a world issue. Because uh, if uh, a country is strong, could impose by force to a neighbor, which is not threatening him, whatever he wants, passing through war crimes, as it's passing through, destroying a country, make an Aleppo, make, making Mariupol the European Aleppo, and making Ukraine the second city, yeah? then the whole world is in danger. And I think that the lady that presented this event said that very clear. We need more rule of law at the international stage. And we need a better balance of power. And I am very much in favor of giving this power to the global south. The world cannot be a place to live on the years to come without a rebalancing of power and opportunities between the global north and the global south. And one of the bad consequences of what's happening is that we can push Russia to China and we can create a division between what we can say the Southeast, the global Southeast, and the global Northwest. China plus Russia plus other countries being the most populated part of the world, the biggest sources of the world, not the richest. And on the other side, small sources, small population, aging population, more assets, more power. This is going to create an incredible imbalance in the world. And we have to avoid this trend. And in order to avoid this trend, the first thing to do is to stop this war of aggression, war of attrition today. And that's what we are doing. To support Ukraine, also by military means, without escalation, without a horizontal or vertical escalation that could bring to a bigger conflict and try to put pressure in Russia by all our capacities in order to make, to pay the price of it. Look, it's ridiculous to believe that Ukraine was a threat to Russia. As ridiculous as to believe that Kuwait was a threat to Iraq. And in this part of the world, you know very well what does it mean, aggression. Because some of your countries in the Gulf have been suffering aggressions. And you know very well what it is, a nuclear threat because you know what is a nuclear threat. And you know what means the aggression, the pertinent, systematic aggression. And by the way, I want to express my concern by the attack that you have been suffering from the Houthi rockets in Saudi Arabia that we condemn strongly. We are against aggression, any kind of aggression. It cannot be the law of the jungle. If we land Putin 
to put their rule on Ukraine just because he has more firepower, then who is going to be the last? Who's going to be the next one? And where? So don't believe that it is a, another war among Europeans. We, Europeans, we have rejected the war as the way of solving conflicts. And we are the quinta essence of multilateralism. And I am in charge of making consensus between 27 different countries, so you can imagine the amount of dialogue that I am practicing every day. I am very much in favor of dialogue to solve the problems. And what's happening is just the contrary. Is the law of the stronger. Might makes right. We cannot afford this. This is the danger for the whole world. The world that wants, as the presenter said very well, more rule of law at the international level, more equality, more cooperation in order to face the global challenges. Uh, environmental degradation on one side and technological devolu evolution on the other side. But what do we see? We see that instead of more cooperation in order to face global challenges, is the new fight among powers that is coming again. It is the fight among the power in order to define what is the sovereignty, sovereignty of the nation, sovereignty of the people. We are at a critical moment of the history. That's a tectonic change on the way the world is working. It is the end of this 40 years period in which China and US were complementarity, were certain complementarity between China and the US, with the Soviet Union fall down, with the war in Afghanistan, with the Islamic Revolution in Iran, all these things have changed completely. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine has set a completely new scenario. We cannot afford Putin to impose its law. Mm -hmm. um, I hear you both very well, High Representative and, and Senator Graham. But a question to, to both of you, but also to Your Excellency and, and, and Highness as well. So it's very clear that there's unity between um, the United States and Europe today on what to do on, on Russia. The longer the war drags on, the, the graver the humanitarian crisis, the greater the cost back home in those European capitals, and not just the European capitals, the cost to other parts of the world, the food security challenge that you, are, you rightly you, you point out. The longer it continues, how long do you think you're going to be able to hold the current coalition it's number one question. Number two question, you have that unity today, but can it hold, for example, High Representative Burrell vis-a-vis -vis China as well? Can Europe hold its own unity today vis-a-vis -vis China? So those are two, two questions, and I do welcome Our Excellencies and Highness to also um, chime into the debate, but this is very much a central issue in the newfound transatlantic positioning that we have before, there were, there were doubts about that coalition. It's been found. But how long is it going to, to last? Because there is pressure being felt at, at home as well. Well, I think this is the two really ultimate questions. I know the suffering is hard to witness. How long will it last? As long as the Ukrainian people are willing to die for their freedom. Here's what I think. I think the Ukrainian people are not going to accept a peace deal that's not genuine. Remember the Budapest uh, memorandum? They gave up the third largest nuclear force on the planet, the Ukrainians, with a promise that Russia, the United States, and Great Britain would basically honor their sovereignty. How many of you believe that they had that deal to do over again, they would have taken a different course knowing what happened? So it's important we get this right. It's more important that we get it right than when it ends. Now, if you're in Ukraine, you want it to end right now. But if this ends badly, as the gentleman said, then you're going to unleash holy hell throughout the world. I am convinced that if Putin gets away with this, China will take Taiwan much sooner. I'm convinced that if Putin gets away with this, the Iranians are going to be more aggressive, not less. The converse is true. If Europe and the United States and the Mideast and the rest of the world can see this through, give the Ukrainians the weapons they need uh, to take the fight to the Russians. 
The Russian military on the ground is beginning to break. It's the air campaign that's wreaking so much havoc on the Ukrainian people. Give them the MiGs. Every weapon system we've given Ukraine, they've used effectively. Give them the S-300s. Give them the ability to control their skies. Be clear, if there's a chemical weapons attack on the long-suffering people of Ukraine by Russia, I would advocate fiercely for a NATO no-fly zone. We can't sit, on, sit back after 50 years of conventions against chemical weapons use, watch it happen and do nothing about it. So tell the Russians that if you drop chemical weapons in Ukraine, there will be a contest for the skies. If there's a tactical dev nuclear device exploded inside of Ukraine by Putin because he's losing to scare all of us away, I consider that attack on NATO itself because the fallout from a nuclear explosion will contaminate Europe. The one thing that's been missing in this debate is clarity. Clarity as to what happens when Putin escalates. To my friends in Europe, the Germans have done things that nobody could envision a month ago. Putin is still getting five to seven billion dollars a week from oil purchases made by Europe. I am convinced that the Russian people are beginning to understand that as long as Putin is their leader, they have a very dim future. I believe things in Russia will change over time if we keep the sanctions on. And the only way this can end in the right way is for the Russian people to, to take matters in their own hands and bring about a change in regime. I really, honest God, believe that. If so you Senator, wanted the world so to change, Graham, let me just clarify. Are you, take Putin are you, out. Are you suggesting regime change? I am suggesting that the Russian people deal with Putin. I'm not suggesting Americans invade Russia. I'm not suggesting American boots on the ground. But here's what I am saying. I'll let the gentleman talk. After Aleppo, after Chechnya, after the Ukraine, after killing opposition people, after stealing his country blind, why the hell would we want him to stay? He's been the most destructive force for the last 20 years on the continent of Europe. He's reaped havoc all over the world. He's formed with Iran to keep Syria dismembered. So it is time for him to go. Okay, I heard you very clearly. Um, High Representative Farrell. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Uh, well, the transatlantic unity has never been stronger. Mm -hmm. I've been working with the U.S., with the Trump administration, and with the Biden administration. And this is also a tectonic change. Uh, I had the honor yesterday to sit in the European Union Council and to receive and to hear President Biden. And so I think I can say uh, that uh, we agree completely. But take care. This is not the worst, the West against the East. It's not the coalition of the Europeans and the U.S. to face Russia. It's much more than that. Certainly, Ukraine is our, is our neighbor. We have with Ukraine the biggest and stronger partnership agreement that we have with any other nation in the world. So it's normal that we take care, a lot of care with these people. And we have been doing things that uh, it was impossible to imagine before the war, like spending our money from the European Union budget to provide arms to Ukraine to fight. And I think that thanks to this military support, Ukraine is resisting. But Senat Senator, if I can say, take care with drawing red lines. Yeah. Because when you draw red lines and someone overpass them, you have to act. Mm -hmm. And it has not been always the case. So take very much care on drawing red lines. Take very much care on not spreading the war, neither vertically nor horizontally. And try to engage in the intellectual and moral fight against Russia, the whole world. Because I am very much aware that, yes, we got a lot of support in the United Nations, but also quite an important number of abstentions. And in the world, there are feelings that are still there 
coming from the colonialist time and the Russia influence in Africa, this matters. Mm -hmm. I've been talking with a lot of global South leaders, South America, in Africa, and we have to make a big effort to make understand everybody that for us, Western people, globalization is no longer westernization, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we believe that. And in, order, and in order to regime change, yes, I have a lot of uh, admiration for these Russian people who go to the street to demonstrate against war. Mm -hmm. It's quite easy to go to demonstrate against war, against war in, in Madrid or in Berlin. By the way, people don't go a lot, yeah. not too much. Uh, my main concern is not to make this a new a revival of the Cold War so between the West and the East. And that's a good point in which to end. We're going to be talking about Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine throughout the entire weekend. It's not all about Ukraine. And both Our Highness and Your Excellency, you both also raised um, two other um, crises um, and political issues that are close to home for both of you, um, Afghanistan and, and Iran. And I'd like to, to ask, um, start with, with you, Your Excellency, and Your, Your Highness as to, as to where we are um, today in relation um, to Iran and whether a peace agreement in your own, in your own minds um, is, is imminent. And I'm, I'm quoting here um, High Representative um, Burrell. I saw on his, on his Twitter account as I was preparing for the session to quote you, you said, essentially ready and on the table. Is it, Your Excellency? Well, I think uh, you can better ask the parties of the agreement to give you uh, probably a better answer. I can just uh, reflect on, on the regional perspective or on Qatar perspective, uh, uh, first of all. Uh, I think it's important for us to see some stability in our region. And we believe that having an agreement on the nuclear uh, on the nuclear issue uh, in Iran is, is an important element, but it also needed to be followed by a regional engagement with Iran to address the regional uh, security issues. And uh, I think that uh, the only way forward, as, as I have mentioned, that uh, the way that Qatar is foreseeing that all, all the problems and all the conflicts should be addressed diplomatically because we see that it's the best way uh, to address uh, the concerns of, of, of each parties. We, uh, we think that JCPOA is an important uh, agreement, at least to make sure that there is no nuclear arm race uh, happening in, in our region, but also it, can be, uh, it will be always incomplete if it will not be complemented with a regional security engagement uh, with Iran, especially between the GCC and Iran in order to have to to have a holistic approach to that, I just wanted uh, to comment on what High Representative and uh, Senator Lindsey Graham have said on about the war of Ukraine. I think that, as uh, uh, we mentioned uh, first uh, at the beginning of, of the session, that it's it's very important to deal with uh, uh, with all the matters around us with equality. And I have maybe highlighted this uh, on the vaccination issue of, of COVID, but it's applied to all the humanitarian crises. And m probably I, I will be maybe off the diplomatic talking points here, but uh, the humanitarian suffering that we have seen in Ukraine, and everyone is talking about it right now, it has been the suffering of a lot of countries in this region for years. And uh, nothing happened, actually. <laughs> we have never seen a global response to address those sufferings. And we've been calling for this, that setting a precedent in the regions by having, witnessing the brutality uh, against the Syrian people or against the Palestinians or against the Libyans or against the Iraqis or against the Afghans, without having... <laughs> without having a proper response uh, globally uh, uh, to these kind of actions and without holding those people who committed these actions accountable, we are going to see more and more uh, expansion of, of such a behavior. So 
I hope that what's happening for us right now and what we have seen between Russia and Ukraine to be addressed diplomatically, to be addressed in a way that putting an end for this conflict, putting an end for the humanitarian suffering, but I hope this also will be a wake-up call for everyone in the international community to look at our region and to address uh, uh, the issues that's happening in our region with the same level of commitment that we have seen between Russia and Ukraine. And Thank you. when we talk about a... <laughs> and when we talk about a balancing of the you know, international um, order, it also has to be, as you're rightly saying, Your Excellency, a balancing, you know, and more equitable response um, in all sort of humanitarian um, actions towards all crises that, that we're facing. I think that's an, an important point. Could I make mind. a comment? Oh, I'm right. just going to ask His Highness to, 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 to step in. I'll try and be brief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'll pick up exactly on Sheikh Mohammed's point, yes. because he made it very well. And I, I'd say, uh, uh, High Commissioner Borrell mentioned that Mariupol is Europe's Aleppo. Well, Aleppo was our Aleppo. Yes. So uh, uh, the problem is exactly in that. And but the, we didn't do Aleppo. It was not. No, us. no, I understand. But this is the whole issue. Who, who was bombing Aleppo, not the European? No, but the engagement of the global community, the engagement of the powers that could be effective now and then is quite different. And the issue here is, again, this conversation. The transatlantic unity right now is commendable. But I think you have to have a much better conversation with the rest of the global community. You yourself mentioned that there was some resistance in the GA. It's not because of uh, Russian links necessarily, but I think it's just not having enough of a conversation about how we deal with this in a globally fair context. I think very much like Sheikh Mohammed uh, was uh, discussing. So I think that conversation needs to go deeper, especially as we deal with crises of the future, because there will be crises in other parts of the world as well, and here we will need to be, uh, stand together. Gentlemen, we have come to our time. Oh. We are going to be continuing to face. I, I will give you, Can I say a, a word I'll give you five G2A? seconds right to reply to this issue, but, but please go ahead. And then, Senator Graham, I know that you have no, a right to uh, And, um, I, Sheikh, um, Her Excellency, I'd like to end with a final word from you. I don't want to lose the opportunity to talk about the CPOA. Since, go ahead, please. Since uh, I, am, I suppose a lot of people are mm. interested here on that. And as I know, I am uh, the coordinator of the talks, the Vienna talks, and my team has been installing in Vienna for the, a lot of months. I lost them because they are just working with the GCPOA. And I have to say that, uh, well, the GCPOA was working well, I think. The, thanks to the GCPOA, Iran has not become a nuclear power. And that's what we want to avoid, Iran becoming a nuclear power. And then other issues. Certainly, but you know, step by step, the first thing to do is to avoid Iran becoming a nuclear power. GCPOA was working well mm -hmm. until the unilateral withdrawal of the U.S. under the administration Trump. Right. And now we are very close to an agreement. And okay. I hope it will be possible because now we are discussing about collateral issues that have nothing to do with the core of the nuclear deal. So yeah. I think I can bring a hope but uh, the work has been Thank hard, you. and we are reaching an end. Senator Graham, 30 seconds, and I want to give the final word to His Excellency. Yeah, Thank I'm you. sorry to hold you up. <laughs> but the average American believes that we have been involved in this region. For 20 years, we've been in Afghanistan. We spent a trillion dollars, and we lost almost 3,000 troops. Aleppo, we should have done more, right? Uh, Yemen place is starving. How do you deal with the long-suffering people and not reward the Houthis? How do you now help the starving people of Afghanistan without locking in Taliban rule forever? Isolationism is what I fight every day in America. There's a lot of Americans believe that no matter what we do over here, it doesn't work. Here's what I would say. This is the best region of the world for America to be involved in because things are changing for the better here. I come here enough to know that the future of this region is brighter than it's been in my lifetime. Thank you. And finally, about clarity. If you don't tell Putin what we will do, you're making a mistake because he sees it as weakness. If you don't tell the Iranians what their red lines are regarding their nuclear program, you're going to live to regret it.
Thank you, Senator Graham. Um, Your Excellency, I'd like to leave the final word with you in terms of your expectations um, at the end of the two days of the forum in terms of how we transform for, for a new era going, going forward. Well, I think the bringing uh, all our guests here uh, in Doha to discuss how we can go <coughs> through this uh, uh, turbulent time in transforming to a new era in, in, in a way to mitigate our risks through dialogue and through more engagement, strengthening multilateralism, uh, uh, stressing on the importance of protecting the international order and international law, but also it's very important to have uh, such a dialogue between the North and the South, as uh, His Highness mentioned uh, in his remarks, and also to look at the issues and crises around us with, with a lens of equality. And I think this is very important uh, for us to hear here in the region to see the same level of engagement to the issues that related directly to us. And I thank you for emphasizing that point about thank equality you. right thank now. You. Thank you very much. Please, thank you very much.